welcome to the final podcast episode of 2022. That is so crazy to say. I'm Von Ellerbrook, and I want to welcome you to another episode of What Matters Most as we wrap up the year. And we've got a special one for you today. Tabitha and Brian Kaplinger sat down over Zoom with our new friend, Matt Michalatis. Matt is an author and a full-time TV and film writer who lives in Portland, Oregon. His books include Journey to Love, My Imaginary Jesus, and the young adult fantasy, The Crescent Stone. If you're a part of Faith Community, you may remember a message Brian spoke a few months ago based around the ideas of his book, My Imaginary Jesus. Check the show notes for that message if you missed it. You guys, this conversation is full of those little gold nuggets you're going to want to write down or take some serious mental notes for real. They talk about the dynamics of our relationship with Jesus and how that intersects with the Bible, history, community, and church. They also explore how we can be wrong about Jesus and who he is and what he said and the ways that we can grow and change as we continue to walk out our relationship with him. We're just a couple of days away from Christmas now, so whether you're traveling, preparing your favorite holiday dish, or wrapping gifts as you listen, I hope you're reminded of the nearness of Christ and the wonder that's found as we pursue Him. He is good, and He is trustworthy. So sit back and enjoy this conversation with Matt Michalatis on What Matters Most. So here we are on our What Matters Most podcast. Those of you who have been listening, we um, thank you. And we are so excited because we have a special guest with us today. But before we get to the special guest, I am Tabitha, one of the pastors here. Um, I lead the young adult ministry. And I am here with my husband, Pastor Brian. Say Hello. Hi, Brian. And so I get the privilege of being her husband and also being a pastor on staff (laughs) here uh, for community life and staff development. And we're really excited for the conversation we're going to have today. A few weeks ago, a couple months ago now, by the time this airs, it's been a couple months. Uh, Brian, you did a message um, on imaginary Jesus, and it really resonated with our church community and that message was inspired by a book that you love. It's one of your favorites. Absolutely. Books. It was one a number of years ago that I picked up, um, and it just really challenged me to the core. And so as I was thinking about the topic, I really just I felt like it was God's timing that we brought it to the church at that point and really kind of talked about it, especially in light of what culture is right now and what's going on uh, for a lot of us still kind of uncovering, maybe even unraveling our faith to a degree um, to really uncover the truth of what we believe, what we know, um, and even how we've been raised um, to see certain things. And I, it was just such a fascinating time. But I've used the book, My Imaginary Jesus, not only to give to our graduates that are graduating high school, to challenge mm-hmm. them to kind of continue to think about their own personal faith. And so it was kind of, for me, an exciting and no-brainer when God brought that back to me to kind of use that as the launching point for that message a couple months ago. And I think as we head into this fun holiday season with Christmas coming and Jesus's birth right around the corner in which we celebrate, I think it's just a fun conversation to really talk about how we view him and not just like baby Jesus, like the old movie and Talladega Nights and all that fun stuff. So... (laughs) Yes. Um, and so we are excited to have today, like we said, when you preached that sermon, it just really resonated with people. And we wanted to continue the conversation on the podcast. So our special guest is actually the author of My Imaginary Jesus. So Matt, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Hey, everybody. I'm Matt Michalatis. So glad to be with you all. I wrote Imagine- My Imaginary Jesus came out 13 years ago. I think. So I was telling my wife, I'm going to be on a podcast to talk about my book. She's like, oh, which one? I said, oh, the first one. (laughs) So pretty funny. Yeah, that was my first book. I've got, I don't know, 12 or 13 books since then. uh, I'm a full-time writer. I used to be in full-time ministry. So I was a missionary for 20 years. uh, And now I work full-time writing TV and movies uh, and still, you know, books as well. And I live in the Portland, Oregon area with my wife and one of our kids and two of the other kids are off at college. And we also have a gigantic <laughs> rabbit named Bruce. And that's we've seen, a, we've that's seen the rabbit. On right. Instagram. There's been a number of pictures He's, there at, of the rabbit. Yeah. I love He's a, it. <laughs> He's a pandemic pet. So we're very thankful for him. <laughs> 
I love it. Our our youngest daughter loves all animals of all kinds, and she <laughs> also very much loves all the bunny content oh, on your man. Instagram. She's excited about that. But I have to tell you, Matt, because we yeah. I sort of online virtually connected with you because of Realm Makers, right. which is a consortium and a conference for writers of Christian writers of um, speculative fiction. But I was really excited the first time I saw you post something in Realm Makers because I could tell my husband because he is not an avid reader at all. And he loved My Imaginary Jesus so much. He read it so fast. He raved about that book. And he hasn't even read my books that I write all the way through. But he just loved that book so much. So when he found out that we were even remotely somehow connected through Realm Makers. He was so excited. So I think he's been looking forward <laughs> to this conversation for probably for 13 years since Amazing. the book first came out because that's no when he read it and no he loved it. Whatsoever. He loved it so much. So he's a fan. He's oh, a man, fan. that's amazing. Well, Brian, I have to tell you, my wife doesn't read all my books either. Makes me feel better. Um, this, the <laughs> book after Imaginary Jesus was called Night of the Living Dead Christian, which is like, what if a werewolf went to church, basically? <laughs> and uh, my wife starts reading it. She's maybe a third of the way through, and she goes, look, this book is fine, except for all the talking and the <laughs> monsters. I was like, that is all the book is. Like, the rest of the book is just monsters and talking. She's like, yeah, I'm out. <laughs> so... We have an understanding that I'm not always, she's not always my first audience. There you go. That, yeah. Very supportive. I, I understand. Just not necessarily. Absolutely. That's true. He is very supportive. He is super supportive, but it's okay that my books aren't his cup of tea, but I also have to pick on him about it at least it's a little bit. It's only fair. Every now and again. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, that's and right. And especially because he, I mean, he really loved this book. So let's jump into this conversation first. Um, Matt, would you share with us maybe some of the inspiration for My Imaginary Jesus, if you can yeah. remember back to writing that for, <laughs> back first to the, one. Back to the old to days. What did inspire that? Uh, yeah, so I was working in full-time ministry with college students at the time. And I was struck by how many college students around the around the world, really, but mostly around the country, as I was interacting with them, had these really strange pictures of Jesus. I really vividly remember this one student coming up to me after a talk, and he said, uh, you said that Jesus loves me, you, you know, no matter what I'm doing, no matter what I'm thinking about doing, despite what's happening in my life, that Jesus loves me. I said, yeah, that's right. And he's like, I just don't think you know who Jesus is. I was like, really? <laughs> Tell me more about that. And his whole picture of Jesus was oriented around the idea of the angry, vengeful God who was waiting for you to step out of line. Mm -hmm. He was going to smack you. And I was like, well, let's just look at scripture. Like, where do you see that in Jesus's life? And he pulled up a couple things, usually when Jesus was talking to the religious leaders, right? And I said, okay, what about this story? What about this story? And his eyes kept getting wider and wider. He's like, wait a minute. It seems like Jesus really loves sinners. I was like, yeah, I think that's right. <laughs> and he was stunned, like stunned. Wow. And I was like, man, what? That's so interesting. So what I wanted, what I set out to do was write a book, not to say, here's who Jesus is, but to say, how do we recognize that there are fake Jesuses in our lives? Because for me to tell you exactly who I think Jesus is, first, there's a million books that do that. And second of all, I was like, well, what if I discover I have a fake Jesus after I write this, <laughs> you know, tw 13 right. years later? And I'm yeah. like, ah, oh, dang it. <laughs> um, so, so I set out to write a book and originally it was essays. And my pitch was, I don't know if you guys remember uh, Don Miller's book, Blue Like mm -hmm. Jazz. Yeah. Uh, Once Upon a Time. It was like the huge book. Uh, so I was pitching it as Blue Like Jazz, but funny was the idea. It was like a little stand-up routine about Jesus uh, being fake or, uh, you know, uh, not being fake, but us having imaginary Jesuses. And my agent, the guy who became my agent, read it and he goes, I love the pitch so much, but I get the feeling you're not writing what you want to write. You're writing what you think will sell. I was like, absolutely. <laughs> he said, write what you want to write. I was like, man, it'll be real weird. And he was like, yeah, that, I want to see that. I was like, okay. And so I started writing what became chapter zero of My Imaginary Jesus, which is, it's, it's a novel, right? So it starts out in this little cafe in Portland called The Red and Black, where the main character, Matt Michelotis, uh, runs into Jesus. 
and uh, there's a fight, and Jesus makes a run for it, and there, all sorts of things happen. And it kind of goes, it, it goes worse from there, probably. Uh, and it's one of those books that literally you can tell, I tell people all the time, they're like, should I read this? I was like, read chapter zero. And if you like it, you'll like the rest of the book. And if you're like, what is going on? I hate this. Do not continue. <laughs> um, so that's where it came from was like this combination of like, how do we uncover these imaginary Jesuses in our lives? And also how do we do this in a fun, enjoyable way? Like, I always say I invented the comedy theology novel and there's, there's two of them, right? There's imaginary Jesus and there's night of the living dead Christian. So one of them's the best in the genre and one's the worst. And you know, who knows which is which. It's That's subjective. It. Art is yeah, subjective. I mean, yeah, it's absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> but that does raise a really, really great question. Absolutely. And it's such a creative way to raise it. I fully believe that stories can get to us in a way that sermons can't. And so I think yeah. writing it as a novel is is kind of brilliant because <laughs> it, um, it it because it does catch you off guard and you don't know what to expect, but it raises that question of is the Jesus I am following a figment of my own making? Mm-hmm. And how how do I know what it, how do how do I re- how do I recognize right. that? I can remember you know I mm-hmm. still to this day when I first came across the book Matt and was reading it and really just kind of being challenged in my own right in that but mm-hmm. the the fun and the humor also you know kind of mixed in with some of the truth and reality made it so much more palatable for me to digest because you know I come from a broken family that has gone through a mm. lot uh in that but I've also yeah. been involved in ministry for 20 plus years and so I've seen good and bad unfortunately of all types of people and even in growing up sure there was a lot of forced tradition on me that i didn't realize until i really began to read the book that i had created jesus in a comfort way because i didn't want to address Mm. the growth that needed to happen in my own life and it was really really easy for me to just picture jesus this way because he was forgiving he was gracious he was merciful without having to force myself or to look at Jesus and go, yes, he is gracious, loving, he's merciful, but there's also a challenge from him to be the better version of myself. And so it it yeah. started to give me language to really kind of talk to myself, talk to people around me, because I'm a verbal mm-hmm. processor. And so I started, I mean, Tabitha's already said it a little bit. I started talking to everybody about this concept of imaginary Jesus, because I was like, <laughs> It was so real to me because I began to see not only from your story, but I could begin to physically picture those Jesuses in my own life. And Mm. I started to begin to be able to root those out and go, man, that is an aspect of Jesus, but I'm not seeing him fully. And if I'm not seeing him fully, I can't ultimately expect to know him fully. And so I had to go back on that journey of really not like deconstructing my faith because my faith was strong, but it was really deconstructing the image that I had put in front of me as Jesus and really address those things in my life to go, yes, Jesus is this, but there's so much more to him than that. And Mm -hmm. I found Mm -hmm. that I had put him in a box. Hmm. I mean, it's so tempting, right? Because there's a lot of reasons why, but I mean, one is that you're not sitting down physically with him, which is one of the things, that's one of the great things about the novel is you can show your, here's what it might be like to sit down with Jesus face to face, right? And then it's so tempting because the real Jesus, when we look at the stories about him, made people uncomfortable, (laughs) angry, furious, they're (laughs) weeping for joy, and you have to stop and look and go like, is that how I'm interacting with Jesus? Is that how, Am I experiencing wonder and worship and fear sometimes? You know, um, and I think what we want to do is we want to tame Absolutely. him, right? We, yeah, and putting That's him in good. a box is an easy way to do that. Uh, where <laughs> where Jesus is this you know ever present help in trouble and never causes right. me any trouble, uh, and that's. Uh, Gosh, that's nice. It's so nice. <laughs> it sounds good too, right? Oh man, it sounds amazing. 
It's way more comfortable. It's way Uh more comfortable for me to just pick the pieces that I like and the pieces that don't stretch me and the pieces that, you know, sound good on a pillow or a coffee mug, you know, (laughs) those like we were like the really encouraging pieces. And like Brian said earlier, all the pieces that are grace and forgiveness, which is who Jesus is, but there's also holiness Mm -hmm. and we can't, Mm -hmm. we can't really, we want to separate the two. In, in lots of ways for lots of yeah. reasons. Well, I think but it's tempting can't. to, I'm sorry, go ahead, Tom. No, go, no, you go ahead. I was going to say, I think it is tempting, like Brian was saying, to isolate this true thing about Jesus and make it all Jesus is. Like there was a, yeah. when we're, we're in the midst of like a family uh, trauma a number of years ago, and that just was creating enormous emotional discord and mourning and grief uh, in our family. And there was a church my kids were going to, I, I wasn't going to it. They went to the youth group there. So I would occasionally drop into the church there. And it was a very, um, triumphalist church, meaning always the message was about how Jesus overcomes all and, and will be victorious, mm-hmm. which is true. Scripture is very clear on that to the point though, that they never talked about the issues and worries and troubles right. of the world and how Jesus intersects mm-hmm. with that. But literally there were hymns, where they would skip, you know, there's the first the first verse everyone knows. Second and third and fourth, you know, maybe you skip to the fifth. Um, but those are often where it's like, and yeah, in dolorous sorrow, I wander and Jesus comes upon me. You know, they would always skip that stuff. So like literally popular songs, there would be phrases they left out and things. If it gave any indication, there might be hard times in this life. And I found it profoundly distressing as someone in the middle of a hard time. Yeah. Um, but for them, it was this really comforting, beautiful thing. And I was like, gosh, it's Jesus, but it's, it's not, it's not a Jesus that's sufficient for me that's right good. now, uh, that's which good. again, you get to that temptation. Do you want to make the Jesus who's going to be all one thing? Like I'm faced with that temptation as well. It's always easier to see everyone else's imaginary <laughs> Jesus is inside <laughs> right. of your own. But uh, yeah. <laughs> we can we can definitely have an easier time looking pointing out things that other people are missing because oh, yeah. we don't want to ask ourselves that question. I don't I don't I I like my comfortable. I like yeah. my I like my Jesus without a side of suffering. Yeah, and I, right. that's really good because I think I was thinking that too to have in the sense of you know this idea of suffering. I think we've we've talked about it a number of times and it's even kind of come up in some other conversations that we've had, but I don't think as Christians we really know or embrace that word suffering and yet that's such a critical component of who Jesus was and not suffering in the sense that you know we're never going to be overcomers or victorious, but that there is growth, there is challenge, there is beauty in suffering and I think the cross exemplifies that more than anything because that was a suffering moment, but what it produced was such a beautiful picture. And, and I, at least I can speak for myself and even some people that I've talked to, it's really, really easy just to look at a Jesus that is comforting, that is loving, that is peaceful and go, that's the only Jesus I want to follow. But I think when we do that, we really miss a component of understanding the fullness of him. And I really think we miss the miraculous of who Jesus is when we only focus on that grace side. Yeah. It's really interesting, right? Cause that, that is one way that we create imaginary Jesus's and a common one. And often we have more than yeah. one, right? We have Absolutely. multiple kind of misconceptions <laughs> at work, sometimes in conflict with each other. And the other thing we can have, and Brian, I think you alluded to this. Sometimes the church you grew up in taught you some things, Mm -hmm. created a framework for God that is uh, convenient for the church or for the culture you're in, but not based in scripture or the reality of God. Um, And sometimes we can have really destructive pictures of Jesus that have been given to us or learned by us uh, for a, a variety of reasons. So like, uh, I think about the political right. Jesuses, right. Which not oh, on yeah. one side or the other, not red <laughs> or blue, but red and blue that are designed to keep people voting for and pooling power towards certain political structures. We don't see Jesus right. doing that. 
Um, We see in abusive situations, people creating a God who hates women, Mm. for instance, uh, or hates other types of people in an attempt to create control uh, for others. And those things are placed down in our life and recognizing those and removing them can be incredibly painful, incredibly difficult, can cause us even to be divorced from a community that's been important to us as we discover the truth of Jesus that the community has failed to, uh, to adopt, uh, which can be really interesting and difficult. For sure. Because we want a Jesus that fits our narrative, whatever that narrative might be. And it's like I think about because you mentioned, you know, even in the political side of things and how often in the last few years when people are upset and they will talk about Jesus flipping tables. Well, Jesus flipped tables. Well, yeah, he flipped tables, but there's a context to that. And that's not all he did. That's and right. so if we if if all we hold on to is an angry Jesus who flipped tables because of because he was upset at a system. Yep. Again, that's not bad, but that's not all of it. And and there's a yeah. why and there's a context. And so if we only hold on to that one moment and that one piece of his life here um, on earth, then we're going to skew something. But for a lot of us like that piece, it fits my narrative. Mm -hmm. I'm angry. Mm -hmm. And so it fits my narrative that Mm -hmm. Jesus is angry too. And again, and he, like, it's more than one thing. Like you say, he's he's much more complex than just this one piece of who he is, but we do that so often. And, and I think in turn, when we focus on that one piece of Jesus that fits our narrative, Mm -hmm. whatever it might be for comfort or for anger or for suffering or abuse, we, we, end up weaponizing him yeah. against other people. Mm-hmm. And that so misses the heart of God. I I think that's an amazing point. And, you know, one of the most distressing places to interact with pastors, present company accepted, <laughs> it, and, and there are many amazing pastors, right? I'm not saying pastors mm-hmm. in general, but a place that really distresses me is mm-hmm. Twitter. Uh, where I'll be oh, online yeah. and I see pastors defending whatever it is they're defending in a really unkind, even cruel way. Um, and I'm like, gosh, you're a pastor? Right. You're meant to guide and oh, move sure. us toward. And and if you push on some of these folks, like I, there are pastors online that I've said to them, like, I just feel like you're not being kind, that you're being even cruel, um, that you're not showing love. And they're like, oh, Jesus wasn't kind. And I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like, Wow. <laughs> Okay, let's talk about that. Like, they'll say it straight out, which is so fascinating to me. Um, But yeah, I think that's exactly right. That sometimes our, it can even be, uh, yeah, we weaponize Jesus. We'll say like, Jesus wasn't kind. He was incredibly cruel to those who uh, didn't follow God in the correct way or something. You're like, well, is that right? (laughs) But it's it's all smoke. It's it's all cover for how this person Mm -hmm. Yeah, is because they don't want to be transformed into the likeness of Christ, which all of us struggle with. Um, But but yeah, I'm always like, gosh, if you're could you just be a little more pastoral? (laughs) That's all I'm asking. (laughs) (laughs) And I I have to remind myself, too. Right. Like it's easy. A lot of social media places are designed to run on anger, to run on fear. And oh, so sure. there are absolutely moments where I'm like furious and starting to type something out. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> like, yeah. okay. Not, that's not even about Jesus, right? That's just about me. It's like, you're an angry person and you need to chill before you press send there. <laughs> right. And, and I think For we sure. all do that. I mean, I'm not a big social media yeah. guy, but I mean, yeah. you can ask, ask my wife, you know, I'll be watching TikTok or on Twitter or Instagram and I'll see a post and it's like, man, I'm fired up. I'm ready to go. Or it's yeah. even counter to <laughs> my thought process. And it's like, well, that's just not the smart way to think about that. I think I need to tell them how to mm-hmm. really live and really do mm-hmm. this. And I think, you know, you hit it on the head there, you know, weaponizing Jesus or even, you know, using Jesus to manipulate people becomes Mm -hmm. very, very dangerous, and that's very out of character for who Jesus was. He never manipulated anybody or used uh, Scripture or him, you know, God 
as a directive to go at people. And so it's fascinating because yeah. I think it brings this question too, and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts, Matt, on this is, you know, how do you begin to uncover those thought processes, maybe that imaginary Jesus or uh, even, you know, what you're talking about here, just these ideologies that we have created? Yeah, that's a, gosh, it's such a big question. I, I would, with most evangelicals, um, I would start here with the fact that you probably have some imaginary Jesus, mm -hmm. right? Some misconceptions, because a lot of evangelicalism is built around this idea that we can perfectly understand scripture and have correct theology, mm -hmm. which is not completely false. Um, there are so many things we can know with certainty from scripture. Um, but we've taken it to such an extreme that people feel that to be wrong about something is to be in mm. sin. And that's not necessarily true. It can just be ignorance. That's good. Right. And, and scripture is also clear that as we continue in relationship with Christ, there are things we learn and even implies that in the heavenly kingdom, we're going to continue to learn right into eternity. Cause this is an eternal being. Uh, I don't know everything about my wife and we've been married over 20 years but I somehow think I know an eternal being inside and out. Uh, it's, it's an incredible act of pride to think that. So I think we start there. So knowing that I probably have something wrong, then we set out to discover what it might be. And obviously the, the clearest, easiest way we can agree on is where does my picture of Jesus disagree with mm. scripture? Uh, so really knowing the Jesus of the Bible and saying like, what is Jesus actually saying, actually doing? How does Jesus feel? What does he think? And where do my understandings of Jesus differ? Or even where do I look at in scripture and I go, I'm not sure what's happening there, or I feel uncomfortable about that. Like, so for That's Jesus good. saying, um, this woman who comes to him, the Samaritan who says, can you please help me? And Jesus says, uh, no, cause you're not from mm. Israel. And I came for Israel. And you don't give bread for the children to the dogs. I'm like, oh, that makes me real right. uncomfortable, Jesus. What are you talking about? Right? That says probably there's something there I don't understand about Jesus, either his character or what he's saying in this moment. And so that's something I maybe want to press into. Uh, and then the two other places that I think are really common. Well, okay, I'll say three more because I'm <laughs> verbose. Uh, <laughs> so three other things. One is um, the community of faith, I think, is really important to like just be sharing and talking about and hearing from others their picture of Jesus and seeing where your pictures are in conflict. And like, what do they know that I don't? Um, what do I know that they don't? That kind of stuff. And then a second thing is C.S. Lewis always talked about how we have blind spots in our generation, mm. that there's value in looking back 50 years, 100 years, 1,000 years into the community of faith and seeing how they saw God. How did they talk about Jesus? And which, th which insights may they possibly have because of their culture, because of the time that they understand Jesus more easily than I do? And which things do I look at and go like, they were wrong about that. Um, and we can, we can dig into that. And then, okay, I said I had three, but I only did two. <laughs> so, oh, the Holy Spirit. Oh no, I forgot right. the Holy Spirit. That's the other thing Jesus said, right? If he, he wasn't going to leave without leaving someone with us who is part of the Trinity, the, the person of God, uh, a counselor who is supposed to guide us into all truth. And I think so often we think of the Bible itself, just the book, as something with power. But the reason it has power is because the Holy Spirit empowers mm, that's us. That's really good. That's empowers good. it to speak right. to us. The Bible itself is not God. The Bible itself is not the receptacle of all knowledge. It's that God speaks to us through it. And God can speak to us through nature. God sp can speak to us through a lot of things. But in the Bible, there's some clarity in the way he speaks. So learning to hear the, from the Holy Spirit. Um, and that that is so fraught. But I think the thing I always remind myself and talk about is um, Jesus said the, the sheep hear and understand. The sh they recognize the voice of the shepherd, right? right? So part of it is learning to recognize all these different voices when it is truly, truly, honestly, the Holy Spirit speaking to us and, uh, and that it takes time and effort and the community and the Bible and the, et cetera. So like the classic example is the guy who says, uh, the Holy Spirit is telling me to leave my wife for this young woman who is my secretary. And you're like, Oh, the Holy Spirit saying that to you. 
huh, that's right. weird. Uh, Cause yeah. that seems like against everything in scripture about how marriage works. And then they're like, uh, yeah, but I mean, it's the Holy spirit. And you're like, okay, well maybe you're not, maybe you're confused on who you're right. hearing from, you know? So that's an extreme example to say like, that's happening in my life as well. Right. So learning to hear when God is actually speaking to me. So that's, that's a bunch of stuff. I'll, I'll, pause for you all to correct me or ask <laughs> no, it's all good, good. yeah Foot absolutely tables. i mean I, and i love it because i think there's a component where you have to put all three of those into your life it can't just be right yeah. well i'm gonna do this i think it's very important to pick one and start with that one but you're yeah, gonna right. have to incorporate all three of those into your life if you really want to see movement and growth and understanding and begin to have that picture um because that's mm-hmm. that's my journey, especially even in this beginning was, you know, I remember back when I was a 20 something youth pastor and uh, I've been talking with Tabitha about oh, this, man. all the statements <laughs> that I made of who oh, Jesus man. was. And now I'm coming back uh-huh. and I'm going home. You know, all those kids, all those students, man, I'm sorry. Like, I totally gave you a poor picture because I wasn't I, know. I wasn't doing the diligence ah. of really understanding Scripture and reading the context and getting around good quality people that could challenge my view of Jesus and my faith and really pushing that. It's, it's the story of movement to spiritual maturity, though. Um, if we can't embrace the fact that we've got some things wrong and have humility, even when we're teaching, right. To say, this is how I understand the scripture. This is what I believe God is saying. I I'm amazed by people who will go toe to toe with each other and just like viciously <laughs> fight about some theological <laughs> things. Cause I'm always like, I wonder how you're going to feel in right. five years. Like, will this even yeah. matter? There's so many things that, um, I think back in the 1950s in the U S there was a movement. Well, it may have been earlier too. So like maybe the 20s through the 50s, there was this theology that almost every Christian believed about the impassibility of God, which means God never changes. Scripture says that, right? God never changes, which means his emotions don't change like ours do. Uh, so God was perpetually angry. Mm. God mm. was, per- which has damaged a right. lot of us, right? We grew up with some echo of that. Um, but the idea was that God didn't experience emotions. He held all emotions because he can't be changed. Um, and now no, hardly anybody <laughs> right. thinks that everyone's like, well, that seems like a weird, ridiculous thing to explain. Like why you didn't tell your kids you loved them, you know, in the 1950s. Um, it was a cultural, cultural values had seeped into the understanding of, of what scripture was mm. saying. And there was biblical backing for it, right? They had Bible verses and everything, or yeah, look at, uh, the, the, um, people who held slaves, right. Uh, in the earlier parts mm. of this nation, they these were Bible believing Christian people who had a theological reason for what they were doing. And the vast majority of Christianity today looks back in that and says, like, oh, man, they had it really wrong. Um, mm. So, yeah, right. I don't know. No, that's good. No, that's good. Because it, it all requires work. Like, you know, we can talk about, yeah, you have to read your Bible and you know, see who Jesus is in the scripture and listen to the Holy Spirit and be in community. And those all seem like very foundational, fundamental things, really. You know, if you've been a Jesus follower, if you've been around, those are things we talk about all the time. But as foundational and fundamental as they are, I think they are the things that most easily get superseded Mm -hmm. by culture and by our emotions that we are so easy it becomes so easy to like cast those aside or to cast one of them aside and say, well, you know, I, I read my Bible, but I'm not in any kind of community that's going to be iron sharpens iron and where I can talk things out and process, or I'm listening to the Holy spirit, but like you said, but I'm not really seeing if it lines up with scripture. I'm just going with how I feel like he might be saying, and it really has to be all of those things, but it takes intentionality and depth and, and practice in there. And I think it takes being willing to ask the questions somewhere along the line um, in, in church culture for a lot of us, it became taboo to ask questions. It became taboo to think critically about our faith. If this, (laughs) like, we just like, we just believe in Jesus and that's just the end of it. And so if you have questions or if you, like you said, if there's something in scripture that makes you uncomfortable, you just kind of sweep it off 
And but really, there's this piece that says I have to dig in. I have to I have to ask questions. I have to to peek behind the curtain and really go deeper. And that takes work. And it is going to make yeah. us uncomfortable. And I have found the older I get, I grew up a pastor's kid. My dad was a pastor for 40 years, grew up in the same denomination, which I still love. Yeah. But I grew up not questioning a lot of things. Like I right. trust my dad. My dad knows scripture and I just didn't feel the need. And now, like in the last five, 10 years, I find myself asking those questions and digging a lot deeper and going, you know, not everything I said or believed do I feel exactly the same way? Right. Even just in, even in just 10% of it, 90% of it, I can say, I still feel the same way, yeah. but you know, I just, and, and that's been so important to me. And I feel like asking those questions and not being afraid to find myself disagreeing with some of the things I was taught in church or in a certain denomination has opened up such a, a bigger, fuller picture of Jesus. Yeah, such a, a, a more something that's so much more beautiful. And I love the word that you used earlier, Matt, something that's so much more sufficient right. than mm. just the bits and pieces that I was putting together. I wish that 20 year old <laughs> me with all of her boldness and audacity like, <laughs> um, knew some of what I know now. I, I did a blog post about that, like cringy, cringy youth pastor, because we all do, we learn and we grow. And yeah. I think that Two, it's becoming okay with that because part of the not asking questions is we don't allow space for changing our mind about what right. we thought was right and true. And but yeah. it's okay. That's right. And and Tab, I love that so much. And I think scripture is really clear too. Jesus says, "Those who seek right. find." Um, mm-hmm. And we've created in some places a culture where we're saying you should be afraid of seeking because you might find a different answer. Um, but Jesus was pretty clear about that. So, and that's, what's created. There's like this controversy in some parts of the church, like, oh no, people are deconstructing, right? right? Is the term some people use, which just means asking questions about their faith, looking to see Mm. if they believe it's true or not. And the fear is some of these people might walk away from the faith. And in my experience where that's most likely to happen is when they're in a community of faith that doesn't support them as they're asking questions Mm. Because they start to go like, why is everyone so scared that I'm asking these questions? Why aren't they talking to me? Why are they saying mean things about me that aren't true? Maybe none of this is true. Not to say, and that's not to downplay those who have come to different conclusions than me about faith, um, but rather to say, I think if we're honestly seeking what is true, that Jesus says we will find it. And Jesus also says that he is the truth and that Mm -hmm. we should expect that our our search for truth will consistently keep leading us back to Jesus over time uh, if we're being honest in our search. Um, So yeah, like, so for myself, I grew up fundamentalist. Um, So for those who, fundamentalism is, it's like the most conservative, not politically, but conservative in the sense of we don't need to change anything. We have tradition and this is very (laughs) clear. Um, So fundamentalist Christianity uh, does very much what Tabitha, what you were saying, that there's there are answers to any question you might have. Um, and that can be the part that's confusing is this is true in more progressive parts of Christianity, too. There are fundamentalist progressives where they'd say, well, if you have a question, you can read this progressive book. Right. Um, but the idea in my fundamentalist upbringing is the 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 theological movement of fundamentalism, as we typically talk about it was based around this idea of, of scripture and the truth of scripture. Um, and so I grew up being taught over and over, the Bible is true, you can trust it. Um, it is how God speaks, it's very clear, et cetera, et cetera, all of which I still believe. Um, but what started happening to me around the time Tabitha, well, around my 20s as well. Um, so not when Tabitha was 20, because you're sufficiently younger than me, I suspect. Um, you but might yeah, be as surprised. I, <laughs> <laughs> well, you look as if you're much younger than me. Um, was that I started to realize that I still believe the Bible was true, but that I wasn't sure it actually said what I had been told. Mm. Mm. Um, and that was shocking and upsetting and terrifying and incredibly freeing. And some of the places I've come to now where I, d- I don't fall in the fundamentalist camp theologically any longer are a gift to me 
that came mm-hmm. because That's the good. fundamentalists taught me that the Bible was true and from God and could be trusted. And I think that's a hard thing. I see people that walk away from a specific theological movement and are still dealing with the emotions of that and aren't able to celebrate the really beautiful things they got from that movement. That's Um, good. And I I still struggle with that as well, you know. Like, I I do find fundamentalists some of the hardest people when I don't know them to be loving (laughs) to them because I see it. It's like a mirror of my old self. And it makes me judgmental and, and... feel bad about myself (laughs) for (laughs) sure I'm not kind as I could be but I'm working on it no and I think you know I think you know just some kind of like all of this there's so much beauty in just diving in and asking the questions and understanding and growth um like you said earlier too Matt it's it's all part of the maturity and this holiness I think this is the essence of really what God is after is is the maturity within us to begin to address those things and ask the questions. Um, because I can remember, just like you, I mean, for me, growing up in a house, it was all about, you know, the return of Jesus. And that was used as a fear tactic. You better be right or you're going right. to miss this. And I joke about this. Right. But, like, I can remember waking up one morning and nobody in my house was home all the cars were still there and I'm in this dead oh, no. on panic. <laughs> you got right. Left you, I was, I was sure of I that. I had the same thing. Did you, were you, uh, exposed to the Christian horror film? Um, Oh no. What was a, a thief in the night? Yes. When you were a kid? Yes. Same that I had the exact same problems. <laughs> they showed it at my church one week and there's a scene in that movie where there's a like tea kettle going And it keeps going, and this kid runs in and is screaming because she's pretty sure she's been left behind. And then at the end of the scene, her family runs in. What's wrong? What's wrong? Um, But, yeah, Brian, all the time I'd be like, oh, it's real quiet. I guess I've been left behind, and now I'm going to get the mark of the beast and be beheaded. Like, I was just sure. And, and, you know, anytime I asked questions at that point, and I think it was well intended. I think my family and even the leadership of the church that we were a part of, I think— they were very, very gracious in the response, but it was, no, this is what it is. So just go with it. They, they weren't embracing or trying to help me navigate, uh, a growth or, uh, even an ability to study on my own. It was no, it's this, like you were saying with the fundamental, it's kind of, here's what it is. You can ask the question, but here's the answer. Yeah. And you're going to have to go with it. Mm -hmm. And I think now, you know, I look back on that and I go, yeah, there were some things that, you know, sure, made me question a lot of things. But I also can now, being older, look back and go, man, I'm so thankful for the environment that I was in to at least have an understanding of what has taken place and what Scripture actually says but now I need to go back and continue to grow and understand. And something that I wanted to say earlier that you guys had hit on about the community that I just really felt like God kind of spoke it to me, even in this moment, being so intentional for my own life, and I think this for other people as well, is incorporating multi-generations into your relationships, not just getting yeah. stuck with yeah. Yeah, people that your are your age and your walk of life. No, bring in some of those elderly people that have the wisdom and the years behind them of being in the faith while also embracing maybe this new generation and their thought processes and their questions, because all of those things merging together, I think, creates an avenue where you can grow, where you can begin to ask that question of where you're at um, in your own faith and your own understanding. And so, man, I mean, I don't know what to add to that because you both, both of you just said it perfectly in that sense. But, you know, even this conversation right now, I'm going, man, I I really need to break my Bible back open today. I did my devotion this morning, but I need to break (laughs) it back open again because I want to start unpacking some of that. You know, um, one thing I found, Brian, that is so helpful for me personally, and that's the thing, we're told some things that are helpful for all people theologically, but I think as you're growing, you start realizing, oh, I hear from God. My wife hears from God when she's out in nature praying, you know, and I mostly am like, 
I, I attract every mosquito. I, I'm like, the devil is here. Like, it doesn't work for me. Um, but one thing that's really helpful for me is I love looking for the voice of God in popular culture. So in movies and right. TV, where is God speaking to me? And the other thing is I switch up what um, translation of the Bible I read because it's still the Bible, right? right? That's good. But there are places where I've misunderstood because of the way the language that's is really used. Good. And so it pops me out of it when I read something unfamiliar. And there's a new version of, of uh, a new translation of scripture that is not even complete yet. You can get the New Testament uh, called the First Nations okay. Version. I just got that and Did I love you? it so much. <laughs> oh, yes. ter- so Terry Wildman, who it's his project to start. He's a mm-hmm. native pastor. Uh, he's a friend of mine. You guys should have him on the show. He's so great. Um, but Terry set out to say, what if we made a Bible that was translated specifically for the audience of First Nations people, of Native people in the Americas. And it's beautiful. Like, I I read it, and there are times where I'm like, oh, man, is that really what the scripture (laughs) is saying? Is that really what Jesus meant? Mm -hmm. Because culturally, I'm so far from it. Uh, And it helps me stop and say, what was Jesus really saying here? So, like, the, um, I wish I had one sitting next to me here. The uh, the Lord's Prayer. You start getting to this part, you know, daily bread, right? And in the First Nations version, I don't remember it exactly, but it says something like, thank you for the bison. Thank you for the corn. Thank you for that. Like all these things mm-hmm. that were staples right. of the native diet. And to me, I'm like, what? What is he talking? <laughs> That's not right. And then I'm like, no, it's talking about, I don't need daily bread. Like, right. So what are, what are the staples? What are the things God mm-hmm. is providing me for me every day? It helps shake me out of it and realize that there's something deeper than just the words right. there. So I don't know. Oh, for that, sure. Yes, that I is, enjoy. I just got a copy of that <laughs> because you? I saw oh. people talking about it and I, I love, love native and indigenous culture. And yeah. I started reading it and I was like, this is beautiful. Yeah. Even yeah. just, they give native names right. to the, and I'm like, this is just, it, and even that in and of itself kind of automatically shifts your perspective when you see the name of Jesus. And, and it's so, yeah, it's just, I just love it so much. This is not a podcast about the first nations version, but I it's mean, really good. And it's, it's so good. It's a great Bible. It's so good. It really is beautiful. I love it. I send pictures of like the first page of the gospel of Matthew to my dad. Cause again, he was a pastor for 40 years and I'm like, he's going to love this. He's a, you know, cowboy at heart. He loves native culture too. And I'm like, and I'm like, dad, you're just going to love it. You're going to think that it's awesome. But that you know, is an important thing. Like it, I, it's something different that gets us looking from a different point of view. That's where I think um, in the same way that different um, centuries of believers can give us insight, so can different cultural mm-hmm. constructs of Christianity, really right? Good. So that's like when you travel overseas and they do things a little differently at church or when you go to another denomination and they do things a little differently. Yeah. So like last month, a native friend of mine was in town and said, I'm preaching at this native church. Do you want to come? And I was like, yeah. Sounds good. Uh, and there were multiple things that were different. <laughs> Instead, of, we didn't sing hymns. They had a, a, a drum circle that did all mm. the music. Uh, so there was chanting, and it wasn't in English. And um, they did smudging, which I don't know if you know what that is. It's like um, mm-hmm. you burn sage. So this is a traditional native practice. And then you take an eagle's feather or some other uh, you know, holy bird, essentially, and you blow the smoke onto the people in the audience and the idea or the audience, the community, the idea is that the smoke is, it's us creating space for the holy. Right. Um, and they went to every single person there and they put the smoke on your whole body. And the people Mm -hmm. are like taking their hands and pulling the smoke onto themselves. And it was so foreign. Like I'd never done that before. So strange, uh, alien really. Right. That it, forced me to suddenly become aware of what it meant in a way that uh, if they had said, hey, let's have a moment of silence to reflect before we go to the service, I'd be like, yeah, okay, that's what I do. And I'd be like, okay, the dishes need to be done, and uh, (laughs) et cetera, et cetera. But it like shook me out of that and into doing what I was supposed to be doing, which was preparing for the holy presence of the Lord so that God could speak to me. Um, That's awesome. So yeah, going into other cultures can be really helpful for that. And there's a great book, Reading Scripture Through Western Eyes. That's a great book. Too, that talks about that because, too, from our 
our American culture, it's so easy to not fully understand what is happening in scripture, even when we do pick up our Bible, because we're reading it through the lens of our experience and our culture, which is not what it, the culture and experience it was written from. Yeah. And so we can right. miss things. And so mm-hmm. just doing things that shift us out of our norm and out of, you know, what is, again, what is comfortable and what is known to us to get that deeper picture. There's just something beautiful about that. And mm-hmm. I think it's so important. And it, but it comes with like, again, we've got to do the work of it. You've got to want, I think you've got to right. want it. Like how bad, how bad do you want to know the real Jesus? How bad do you want to follow the real Jesus? Do you want it bad? Yeah. Do you want it bad enough to get a little uncomfortable and to do the work? And that's, yeah. 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 (laughs) That's a, that's a thought provoking question. I know literally yesterday I was in a conversation that halfway through it, I was praying and I was like, Jesus, please tell me you're not asking me to do this. (laughs) Like, please just (laughs) let me know. Give me a sign that this is not from you, please. I was like, oh, yeah, but it might have been, might have been. Yeah. (laughs) And that's hard because we, I mean, we can't check our humanity at the door when we're seeking Jesus. It comes with us. And we all, we all face those, those moments where our humanity gets the best of us, where we don't want to be uncomfortable you know, we don't want to be stretched. We don't want to see a different perspective because we like ours. <laughs> yeah. But it, it it's it's important. And I think um, and I'll, this can be like our final little thought here and you guys can tag on. I think part of why this is an important conversation, though, is the Jesus we believe in and the Jesus we follow is the Jesus we're going to reveal to the world around us. Mm. And I want to reveal a Jesus that is sufficient. Mm hmm. And I'm not going to be perfect at it. I'm not going to get it right all the time because I'm human and I'm flawed and I have a sin nature, but I'm going to ask that question and I'm going to keep seeking who he really is because I want to make sure that the Jesus that people see in me is, is man is as close as I can get this side of eternity to the real thing. Yeah, And it's going to take, I mean, it's a process, but that's, I mean, that's, (laughs) What we're supposed to do, right. I guess. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. No, it's good. Yeah, the cat. I'm no, sorry, go ahead, uh, just, I was just thinking, you know, even listening to the last little bit of that, um, if, if you're listening and you're not challenged by that, especially as a Christian, or I think even to a degree, if you're someone who doesn't share the faith right now and you're listening to this, I hope you're getting a sense and understand that, you know, this is a beautiful journey. It's not, uh, hey, I'm going to open up the door. And I think for a lot of people, myself included to some degree, it was like, I'm going to get saved and boom, that's it. That's everything. I've done it. I've done the work. And it's like, no, this is just, when I say Jesus, I want you in my life, it's the beginning, Mm -hmm. not the culmination. And I think Mm -hmm. this journey that we've talked about today is just part of that because we're inviting a real Jesus into our life when we truly accept him. And I think it's important for us to then allow him, and maybe this is a poor choice of words, but to expose the falseness and maybe the negative or wrong viewpoints we've had of him. But we, ha- like you said, Tyler, that we have to do the work. I think it's, a, it's an amazing challenge of, do you really want it? Do you really want it? If you if you want to understand, if you want to know, Jesus lays it out for us. He says, hey, just come and ask. Come and ask. Come and seek, and you're going to find it. And so, you know, what do you, what do you think in the closing here, Matt? Yeah, that's amazing. Um, you know, our Catholic brothers and sisters call this deification, which uh, what, what they mean by that is just the process of becoming like mm. God. And we have to see God and ourselves clearly to do that. If we don't see God clearly, we're like Tabitha was saying, we're we're growing toward the wrong thing. If we don't see ourselves clearly, we can't see the difference between us and the true God. So Mm -hmm. as we see the places where we're different than God, that's when we start to move toward him. Um, So like for me, for instance, one of the things I really found in my growth over the last, you know, however many, many, many (laughs) years 
um, has mm. been what has become central in my spiritual walk uh, as far as a need and growth is that Jesus talks about if you want to do the law perfectly, if you want to do everything right, there's two things that matter. It's loving God and loving other people. And just recognizing that love is really central to the person of mm. God and certainly to the mm. person of Jesus. So that means in these moments when I'm uncertain, we have these really sticky issues, theological issues, moral issues that come up, and I don't know what the right, right. answer is, that I choose the one that leans toward that's love. Good. And then I, that's the safest possible choice. And that I'm constantly looking at my life and saying, okay, how could I be more loving like Christ is loving? How could I be more loving like God is loving? That's good. And that's the thing that for me personally... I find over and over I'm experiencing transformation because how can I be more loving to myself? How can I be more loving to my wife, to my kids, to my neighbors, to the people I disagree with, to the people at my church, to the people, you know, there's mm -hmm. always something. Um, so I feel like God keeps, uh, God's like, good job. You did that one. You grew. <laughs> now let's talk about right. this other thing where you're not very loving. I'm like, are you right. kidding again? <laughs> um, okay, let's do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's good. That's good. Well, as we close up, um, Matt, tell us how people can um, best connect with you if they want to find out about your other books. Or <laughs> uh, if you can spell my name, which is a lot to ask, you can. Find it'll be me. in the sh it'll be in the That's show right. notes too. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, yeah, my last name. There's there's about thirty of us with my last name in the United States. Any of them can point them point you to me. Um, <laughs> they're they're tired of it, but they can do it. Um, yeah, so my, I'm on all the various social media places under my Matt Michelotis, under my name. Uh, you can email me at uh, matt at michelotis.com. Uh, obviously, if you just want to search for my books, wherever you like to buy books, just use my last name. Some of the more recent ones would be Journey to Love, which is reflections on how to accept love more in your life and how to be more loving. It's written for mm -hmm. people regardless of faith, uh, where you fall on the faith journey. Clearly, I'm Christian, but you can read it regardless. Um, or if you like fiction, I have a, a young adult fantasy trilogy called The Sunlit Lands, which starts with a book called The Crescent Stone. So I'd start with one of those, maybe. Imaginary Jesus, you can still find. It's uh, out of print physically, but you can still get ebooks uh, or buy a used copy. But it's still out there. If you want to laugh as I stick the knife in you about Jesus. Yeah. Um, but yeah, those, those are the, those are the best ways to awesome. find me probably. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming and, and talking with us and joining this conversation. I think it was a good one. I know the, I know our community here at our church has loved this conversation right. and probably after Brian's last sermon, um, a bunch of them bought eBooks of my imaginary nice. Jesus. Cause he plugged it big time. Good. Um, but we just we just really appreciate it. So thank you so much for joining us. And to those of you listening, you're going to be listening. It's going to be almost Christmas, which is when we celebrate the incarnation of Jesus. So what a perfect time Absolutely. to do some self-assessment and to ask yourself the question, is the Jesus that you serve, the Jesus that you say is the reason for the season, is he the real Jesus? Um, and and do you how bad do you really want to know? And are you really willing to do the work? And so I hope that you'll take this season as a jumping off point to begin to do that work and that journey so that the Jesus we reveal to the world can be so much um, in line with his heart and his values. So thank you guys so much um, for listening. Okay, didn't I tell you that was such an awesome conversation about knowing Jesus and the journey of growth we take as we follow him. Tab said this, that the Jesus we believe in is the Jesus we reveal to the world. We're human and we don't always get it right. As Christ followers, we've got to keep growing and keep pursuing him so that we share him with the world around us well. Just like Matt mentioned, it's a lot easier to see other people's imaginary Jesus than our own. But over the next few weeks, as we begin a new year, take some time to evaluate what you believe and how that aligns with the Bible. Perhaps you'll find that you've committed to something that is a little off the mark. Maybe you actually don't believe in Jesus right now and you're wondering what this is all about. Wherever you are, just keep going. Keep asking questions and consider reaching out to somebody in your community to walk the journey with you. As we wrap up for the year, I want to say a couple of thank yous. First, thanks so much to Matt Michelotis for joining us in this conversation. 
You can find his work over at Michelatus.com and connect with him on social media at the links in the show notes. And hey, why don't we all go ahead and head over to social media and send him a quick thank you for being a part of this episode. We are so grateful for his insight and his work. Next, thank you for listening. As I've said before, it's really a privilege to bring these conversations to you and to grow together. I'm looking forward to the new year and I'm praying that whether you are already a believer or you're on the fence still, that you would know that Jesus is real, that he is for you and he is good. As always, if you've enjoyed this episode, share it on social media and leave a review and follow or subscribe on your preferred platform. Stay tuned for new episodes in 2023 as we continue to discover what matters most.